Grant, I've got some news. Oh boy, what is it?、I'm... Is it a baby? <laughs> no, no, believe no. it or not, it's、okay. not a baby. Okay, what is it? I'm moving to Slovenia. No, really? Slovenia, like next to the Czech Republic? Slovenia, like next to Hungary and, and Austria and, and Italy and on the Adriatic, there. It's a gorgeous country and it's a hotbed of ape tourism. I can't wait to go. Not, not ape, says in the great apes, but apiary, like aperists, as in beekeepers. Exactly. Exactly. From the Latin apis meaning bee. Yeah, it turns out that Slovenia is a hotbed of beekeepers. Every 200th person, <laughs> every 200th person is a beekeeper. It's just honeycombed with beekeepers. <laughs> exactly. It's honeycombed、wow. with beekeepers. Yes. What yeah. put this bee in your bonnet, Martha? Why are you so bee crazy these days? <laughs> well, I stole you know that from you. You said it the other day. <laughs> You know, But you've you... been on this bee trip. We talked about it on the show. Now、yep. you think you're moving to Slovenia, which I will、yep. prevent. I will stop you at the airport. <laughs> What's the <laughs> deal? Oh, that's sweet of you. Yeah. Well, I want to. Well, we have a show to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I、oh, want to、yeah. at, at least visit because they have these Airbnbs,、uh, or I guess you'd call them Air, B Airbnbs, where you can、uh -huh. lie on a special bed that's next to honeycombs under glass with real bees in there. And so you fall、mm. asleep to the buzzing as、Ooh. they make their honey. You have、oh, really、nice. sweet dreams. This is a life change for you, Martha. Isn't this a little late for like a midlife crisis? Okay. Is it like. <laughs> no, it's, it's a new passion. You know, every few years I,、uh, get, a, I get a passion. And、uh, okay. this, this, is, this is the big one now. This is what I've gotten into in the last few weeks. And、okay, what are you going to do with it? Well, okay, so I'm not really, probably not really moving to Slovenia, but let me show you something. I am now the person, right? You know how. how You know how, like, pianists, everybody buys keyboard stuff for pianists, or if you're really into baseball, all the gifts you get involve baseball. Well, I'm the person people buy B things for now. You know, I really am serious about. becoming a beekeeper. In fact, my wife Bonnie and I have been reading lots of books about bees. Lots and lots of them. And of course, there's some super cool language involving bees, including the term sweetness and light. It means pleasantness, but originally the phrase referred to bees. In 1704, Jonathan Swift wrote that bees provide humanity with two noble things honey 
and wax for candles. That is, he said, they provide sweetness and light. Another cool bee-related term is polyethism. Now, it's not polytheism. Take another look. It's polyethism from Greek ethos, meaning custom or character. And polyethism occurs when certain animals, including bees, hold different jobs at different times in their lives. Worker bees, all worker bees are female, live just 40 to 45 days. And over the course of her life, a worker bee may change jobs as many as five different times. And to show you just how amazing this is, I'm going to use our brand new bee magnets and the side of our microwave. Usually, a worker bee starts out as a housekeeper, cleaning out honeycomb cells. A few days later, she switches to being a nurse, feeding younger bees. Later, she might become a construction worker, manufacturing wax and building honeycomb. After that, she may spend a few days as an undertaker, carrying dead bees out of the hive. Later still, she's a fierce guard protecting the hive entrance. And for the last few days of her life, she's one of those foragers you see outside flying around to collect pollen, nectar, and water. It's really amazing that they do so many different jobs in one lifetime. And the word for that is polyethism. Our yard's too small for hives, so for now, Bonnie and I are tagging along with beekeepers to watch them work. Meanwhile, we're making our yard more bee-friendly. We're planting trees and flowers and putting rocks in our bird baths so it's easier for bees to land and take a drink. Actually, it's just as well that we're not taking on the care of 20,000 insects at the moment, because we have our hands full with some other critters. More about that later. I got a nice email the other day from a fiction writer. They wanted help coming up with language for a time period that they were working on. I get emails like this all the time. You probably do too. Sure. And I love getting these. They're like, you know, I'm writing about, say, the 1880s and the southwest of the United States. How did people talk then? How could we possibly know? What can you recommend? And I'll, you know, send mm -hmm. them some books or resources. But this one was about a, a more recent era. They wanted to know about the punk era, punk rock, you know, the 1970s and early 1980s. Yeah, yeah. And so I, yeah, it's a really, really good question. And, you know, I was born in 1970 and got interested into punk music kind of mid eighties, late eighties, kind of after it was really a thing and had already been really kind of um, overtaken by commercialism. And there was just a, you know, it was kind of more about commerce and, and income than it was about the punk spirit. But there is a really good book about this that I was able to recommend. And this is the, I'm looking at it here. This is the Cultural Dictionary of Punk. And I'll put an image up mm -hmm. on the screen for this. Um, and it's by Nicholas Rhombus. And it's, it says, The Cultural Dictionary of Punk, 1974 to 1982. And he does a really good job of not making it all about, you know, hey, look, they've got safety pins in weird places, or hey, spiked collars. It's really about the ethos of punk and the mm -hmm. people who were there and giving credit where credit is due, both in the UK and the US, because this was this was happening on both sides of the Atlantic, both in London and New York, pretty much at the same time. And even in San Francisco, there was a strong a, a strong scene of it. And and there were zines at the time, these um, amateur magazines, and a lot mm -hmm. of the punk ethos was in those. And there happened to be really fantastic archives online of these zines from the era oh, and wow. they really captured some of the attitude and language of the period and and for me as somebody who really likes edge language and really likes the experience of kind of jumping in with both yeah. feet to uh yeah. to how other people think and other kind of lifestyles and also as a man who's now in his 50s looking back at something i really enjoyed in my late teens um, going back and looking into punk music it was, it was really kind of quite delightful to go into that. So I'll throw some links up into the feeds on that. And uh, and maybe when we post this video for later consumption by anyone who wasn't here, I'll, I'll do a more concrete post of those links. But uh, anyway, I just I just enjoyed doing that and, and helping that person because it's just a, a delight for me to get into somebody else's project and help them out and think maybe 
maybe I had a hand in making that, that novel a little bit better, you know, a little more accurate. Yeah, and isn't that super cool? Yeah, to to just dip into some field because you're pulled in by the language, right? Yeah, the language of it. Well, and for me, a little bit of memory, right? I mean, that Reagan-Thatcher era was a really constricted time. It's a punk kind of burst out and said, we're not taking those rules Mm -hmm. anymore. We're not dealing with that. And punk said, we don't even need to have to play our instruments correctly. We can just get up here and, and sing how we want and play how we want and maybe not play at all. And sometimes just getting up here and tearing the place apart yeah. is the performance. Um, yeah. And not just not necessarily get attention, you know. Sometimes punk music was, punk was not showing up for your own show. That was punk, you know. It was, <laughs> it was, very, it was very interesting because that was too conformist. So it was very, very strange attitudes, but you kind of got where... You kind of get it after a while when you start to read some of these zines. You kind of get that idea of um, breaking out of this conformity leads you to new ideas and uh, new patterns of thought. It's it's very, very strange, but compelling. You know, Grant, it's so interesting that you mentioned that about about punk pushing back against the existing ethos, because... That brings me, weirdly enough, to the book that I've been returning to again and again, which is How to Think Like Shakespeare. <laughs> really, there is a connection here. It's by Scott Newstock, who's, who's a professor at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. How to Think Like Shakespeare, Lessons from a Renaissance Education. And the reason that I'm making a connection here is that he has a lot of different chapters in the book on things like on technology or on conversation or on craft. But but one of my favorite chapters in the book is called On Constraint. And he's talking about how, you know, we tend to think of limitations as, as um, limiting, but they can actually be freeing because creativity really comes when you're pushing against limits like uh, the limitations of the sonnet form for example where does that creativity come from so you've got the sonnet constraints and yet you find your creativity flowering how does that work how do humans do that well, that's exactly it, right? When you're pushing against those constraints, your creativity comes not uh, in spite of the limitations, but because of them. And he, he has this wonderful uh, sentence in there where he talks about how creativity comes from something as banal as project deadlines and budgets, or as, as profound as the finitude of life, or finitude, you can pronounce it either way. But... Um, but it's sort of what you're talking about in, in terms of punk. And I guess the other thing that comes to mind is life gives you lemons. What do you make? <laughs> you make a, a video for a radio show. <laughs> <laughs> and you sip some lemonade, right? You make lemonade out of it. I mean, I mean, I just love that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just love that in some way, we're all pushing up against constraints that we never expected to be. And I mean, think about writing, too. It's it's good to know uh, the, the rules of grammar, such as they are, the ones that help you express yourself clearly, but there's also something to be said for pushing against those as well. Right, and I think we see that more now on the internet. Uh, Gretchen McCulloch has written about this in her because, book, Because Internet, where frequently people misunderstand and observe things as mistakes when really they are intentional avoidances of the traditional rules and the traditional right. structures of writing right. and com- composition. And right. it's to make a point. It's either to be funny or to show irreverence or to in- be in- informal or to exclude others from a group or to include certain people mm-hmm. in a group. There are a lot mm-hmm. of reasons we might intentionally misspell a word mm-hmm. or refuse to use punctuation at the end of a sentence or refuse to capitalize the beginning of a sentence or or a variety of different reasons for that. And so all right. of these, we remove constraints sometimes in order to free ourselves as often as we may put constraints in in order to free ourselves. Grant, this is what I love about our conversations, that we can go from punk and grunge to Shakespearean yeah. Renaissance education and, and everywhere in between. Maybe we should do an, a, a daily show, a daily, <laughs> one-hour daily show, because we, we don't run out of material. 
<laughs> I think we're lucky to have this place where we can download uh, what we're interested in and, and digging yeah, I, once a week. I got to tell you, Martha, you and I talk about this all the time. We uh, feel honored to have the one hour that we're given uh, on the airwaves and on podcast every week. We know that we're lucky to have that and to have people yeah. listening to our voices and, and caring what we have to say. So, yeah, yeah that's absolutely true. We got an email from Chris in Massachusetts who said, every once in a while on the show, you guys mention this job you've had or that job, and some of them are kind of weird, and, and it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that a, a linguist or a radio host would uh, be doing. How, what are the weird jobs that you've had? Oh, right, yeah. Oh, right? so many. <laughs> So many. Yeah. Uh, I, well, we've both been. We've both had paper routes, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. I I mine, delivered the Mexico ledger. Brief. Uh, Mexico ledger from Mexico, Missouri, for three and a half years. What did you deliver? Oh, Mexico, Missouri. Well, I only delivered the Louisville Courier Journal when I was in high school, and it was only for a month because a it month. was such hard, hard work early, early in the morning. But I kid you not, I did it in part because I think I was an aspiring writer even then, and I would ride around in the family car to deliver the newspaper, but I told people I was already writing for the newspaper. <laughs> They assumed W-R-I-T-I-N-G, but you were saying R-I-D-I-N-G? Yeah, and I just didn't <laughs> correct them. <laughs> How about Wait, you? What was your paper route You like? got to ride in a car? I had to ride my bike, even in the deathly winter. Like, my oh, balaclava would freeze on my face. <laughs> How is that fair? Um, but I think the weirdest job I ever had, when I was studying French in Paris, this is a... Uh, 20 years ago, um, I was an older student, and uh, one day one of the people running the program there came to me and said, oh, look, uh, are you interested in making a little cash? I said, absolutely, you know, I'm a college student. And so I uh, ended up doing movie dubbing in English for a French film, if you can believe really? that. Really? Yeah, it was this movie in English called in English Crimson Rivers starring Jean Reno and Vincent Cassel. And um, no I just kidding. did some of the English voices for like young, tough kids and crowd scenes. And it was this big auditorium filled with French cigarette smoke. And they showed the movie and it had like lines of dialogue that I had to say to match the mouths of the actors. And and uh, it was fun. I didn't get to meet the famous people, but it was fun to do. And uh, they gave me a wad of French francs at the end of it. And so if you find this movie, Crimson Rivers, starring Jean Reno and Vincent Cassel, and find the English dub track, my voice is on it. So were you practicing around your apartment there? And I mean, how do you how do you prepare for something? Like no, that? I didn't even know really what the job was going to be. That's how kind of uh, like illicit it was. I showed up and Ooh. I didn't. I, and they're like, can you do this? Can you do that? And I said yes to everything because I wanted to do it. I wanted to make the money. Sure. So can you do can you, can you sound like a kid from New York? And I'm like, yes. Sure, I can. So I did my best. <laughs> I'm a tough guy. <laughs> you know, I helped that I was. I helped that I was in my you know late twenties at the time. I was thirty actually at the time, so I, I was able to do that. So. Oh, okay. And you though, Gosh. you've had a you've had a ton of different jobs. You you we've both been journalists. We've both delivered newspapers. We're both now mm -hmm. working radio. But you've done some things I mm -hmm. haven't done. Yeah, I dropped out of college for a couple of years and uh, worked as a psychiatric nurse's aide in a hospital, which was okay. super cool. But yeah. I was doing that to save up money to go to Israel to work on an archaeological dig, which was oh, so fascinating. That sounds fascinating. Did you find a magical yeah. amulet? give you magical powers? No. <laughs> no, I didn't find an amulet, but but I learned so much. First of all, it, it was at Tel Dan, which is at the very, very, very northernmost tip of Israel. I mean, mm -hmm. you could walk 
to the Lebanese border and, and we were in the shadow of Mount Hermon there on mm -hmm. the on the border of Lebanon and Syria. And you know, I was just a clueless college student. I thought I was going to the desert, but this was this beautiful, lush place with a spring that we drank out of every day for lunch. There were fig trees. People said, this is the Garden of Eden. And, and uh, it, you know, there were, there were fig trees and fig leaves. So who knows? <laughs> but <Right>. um, <laughs> but uh, it was a Rip really bones fascinating lying around. experience. <laughs> right? <laughs> and... Um, but what I learned from that is that um, as interesting as it was to spend a summer digging and washing pottery every single day, what I really preferred was writing about doing that. And so I did that. I wrote a, a cover story for uh, the local newspaper magazine back there in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where I, where I grew up. And so that so, was part um, of your growth of your career as a writer. It was. It was. It was completely unexpected. But but I really felt an urge to write about that experience. Oh yeah. What's the term for having an urge to write a an, an unstoppable urge to write? It's kakawithi scribendi, right? Correct. Yes. And the and, and the one for loquendi is yeah the the uncontrollable urge to uh, speak. But to speak yes, kakawithi scribendi. Unquenchable, unstoppable. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. So how are those sweet kittens, Martha? Oh, they're so sweet. They're one of the best things about the last few months. Um, we found a litter that we call the Fab Five, and uh, they were they were down the street, and mm -hmm. uh, my wife Bonnie got them and brought them back, and uh, we raised them until we started adopting them out. Um, it's much better to adopt out two kittens rather than one, and we kept two. These are feral cats, which are a problem in the canyons of of Southern California, right? Yeah, yeah. We've we've been. Uh, I think we've trapped and neutered five cats, but we didn't get the mama. And doggone, if she didn't get pregnant again, there there are some. <laughs> there's there's another litter of four next door. And Grant, I know you're an ilurophile too. How are your kids? Yes, I love my kitties. Yeah, we love cats. Actually, we love all animals in our house, but we're in a situation where we can't have all the animals we want. So we settled for two cats. We have Bianca and we have Pearl. Pearl is our new one. She is a rascal extraordinaire, but she she um, avoids me during the day. But at night, she likes to cuddle, which is very sweet. Uh, she come Except when she comes at 2.30 for her pets. But if she comes after 5, I'll give her the pets she, that she wants. She likes to be scratched under the chin in particular, but she loves her feather toy and she's a... She loves to chase the insects. She's your typical rascally calico. So. Grant, I'm about out of lemonade. What about you? Yeah, the glass is empty. Uh, we should do this again, though. This is this is great fun. I love talking with you. Yeah, yeah. My glass is em my my mug is empty, but my heart is full. Oh, that's very nice. With with what? Bees, honey, something like that. <laughs> Bees, words, <laughs> gratitude. <Cat fur. laughs> yeah, you know, gr I mean, seriously, gratitude for what you and I get to do every single week and everything that we learn from our listeners. My gosh, I wish we could respond to everybody in email and. Yeah, thanks for all the comments in the chat and all your emails and your phone calls. We we make the most of them. We listen and read everything and we save it all, if you can believe that. You would not believe our inbox it is exploding with your ideas, comments and thoughts and, and your help and your affection and your support of the show. Thank you. Very yeah, much. and it's really a stone soup. Martha, I think we can agree to do this again, right? I'd love to do it again. Sure. All right. It's a deal. Thanks to everybody for their support. Take care. Bye-bye.